So we have a very exciting day today, but it's long. Uh, we'll, we're going to eventually uh, break at about 11 o'clock for lunch for an hour. Um, and we'll try to take at least 10 minute breaks between the sessions. So um, I'm going to stay out of things. I'm just going to ring the bells when the uh, panel sessions should start. And so I'll turn it over to Henry Servo. Dr. Servo. I'm uh, Henry Sergo from uh, McNeese uh, State University. We're going to be uh, dealing with the uh, early uh, 19th uh, century. Uh, we have well, a few program changes. Uh, uh, Christopher Childers of uh, Pittsburgh uh, State University had a, uh, had, a, had, a had a development uh, happen, and uh, so he, he won't be able to make it. So uh, we're going to be, be able to hear more extensively from uh, Professor uh, James G. Ryan of Texas A&M University at Galveston, and there we've got a, a somewhat of a slight title change. It's going to be uh, John Quincy Adams from Presidential Failure to Human Rights uh, Champion. So, uh, thank you, Henry. Good uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I uh, I usually uh, talk about and write about communism, but I, I promise you I, I won't do as Fidel Castro habitually did, and that is to talk nonstop for three hours. <laughs> Instead, we'll go back a century. Uh, certainly, um, since the 1960s, people on the Democratic left uh, have been, <laughs> in, bless you, sir, have been interested in the abolitionists. So although I'm primarily a historian of the 20th century, uh, from the abolitionists on, uh, I've, I've done a lot of work. And uh, today's topic uh, concerns a, a man who has not been given uh, credit. Uh, and I want to talk about why he should be considered certainly uh, one of our uh, great heroes, even if there's not room on Mount Rushmore for him. Uh, most American adults know John Quincy Adams as a 19th century president, and many are aware that his father, John Adams, had served as chief executive decades earlier. Historians usually consider John Quincy exceptionally well prepared, but a disappointment who achieved little and left the White House uncelebrated. Before the modern civil rights movement, Adams' unsuccessful campaign for a second term was usually celebrated as the common man's victory and the arrival of the age of Jackson. And since Arthur Schlesinger Jr. Uh, wrote a book called The Age of Jackson and won a Pulitzer Prize in his 20s, I believe, uh, the, ninth, the 1820s and 1830s have often been uh, the scene of focuses on uh, Andrew Jackson. Uh, for Adams, however, the loss was both a national tragedy and, more importantly, uh, his life's greatest turning point. He had always believed that preserving, expanding, and strengthening the Union would, re would prove republicanism as the best avenue to progress and liberty. But after leaving the Capitol, Adams saw that expansion of federal territory enhanced the slave South's political clout. Uh, one did not have to be exceptionally perceptive to see this, but Adams had uh, been willing to overlook this. And the time uh, out of office after his uh, presidency ended uh, caused Quincy Adams to ruminate over his own career. Uh, let me just throw in parenthetically that um, the Adams family was famous in part for uh, keeping
keeping diaries. And John Quincy had uh, diaries for virtually his entire adult life. Uh, so we, we can know a lot about his inner feelings, or at least as he would like to uh, reveal uh, <coughs> parts of his, his inner, inner feelings. He had always believed, oh, I said that. Uh, For most of Adams's life, he had remained publicly silent about slavery's danger to the Union. Slowly, he came to realize that, with his personal ambitions finished, he no longer needed to suppress his moral convictions for some practical, immediate goal. In his post-presidential years, he looked for ways to resolve the contradictions between the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. Before long, he came to loathe the latter as a betrayal of the former. And he blamed himself for having compromised too frequently in the past. Immediately after his 19, or 1828 defeat, Adams looked forward to retiring to his beloved Massachusetts. Yet fewer than two months after the ex-president had left office, George Washington Adams committed suicide. He was John Quincy and wife Louisa's eldest son. For John Quincy, depression set in, made deeper, <laughs> as his brothers Charles and Thomas and son John Adams II all rapidly fell victim <coughs> to alcoholism. Uh, this was the family's curse. John Quincy narrowly avoided that fate by paying greater attention to Louisa and uh, a, dip, a deeper reverence to God. Always a devout Protestant, um, he quietly likened his lot to that of the biblical Job. <coughs> On September 6th of 1830, the Boston Cour Courier, a Jacksonian paper, suggested that Adams run for the House of Representatives. Given the source, Adams believed this was simply more ridicule from that clever scoundrel, Andrew Jackson. After all, no former president of the United States had ever contended for subsequent public office. And I'm sure most of you know that Andrew Johnson, uh, after leaving the presidency, would be elected to senator uh, from one of the senators from Tennessee. Um, anyway, um, shortly after Adams returned to Massachusetts uh, and considered these uh, proposals as um, something he wouldn't really uh, want dignified with an answer, uh, he was somewhat surprised to find uh, that he had a visitor at his house one afternoon, the incumbent congressman, a Federalist, had come to visit Quincy Adams to announce his own retirement. The office holder feared a Jacksonian might be elected to his seat. Flattered, Adams did nothing, again suspicious, until the National Republican nominating uh, convention and two local newspapers endorsed his candidacy. Shortly thereafter, he notified influential community members that he would serve if elected, uh, as, as was the case with our, our first uh, four or five presidents. Uh, Quincy Adams did not believe in uh, asking people to vote for him. He was a 
expect that they would choose him, but he uh, he was certainly not uh, in, in any campaigning way similar to Andrew Jackson and Martin Van Buren, who uh, definitely campaigned as long, as long as they could and quite vigorously. <clears throat> Adams agreed he would serve if elected, but without saying it, uh, indicated he would not campaign. Adams won the Plymouth District's cons congressional seat in a landslide. At first, he con considered this modest achievement vindication for his 1828 defeat. Always self-critical, however, Adams soon felt that he had not done enough to make his country great. Historian Joseph Whelan argues, nevertheless, that Adams expected his time in the House of Representatives to be brief and unremarkable. On December 5th of 1831, Adams took the oath of office as a 64-year-old freshman. In an era when the lack of modern medicines meant shorter lives and more infirmity. Uh, this, this is often overlooked. Uh, in the 19th century, uh, to retain health in one's 60s uh, was, was unusual. Um, and there were times and places where a person reaching age 70 would get a picture in the paper. Of course, uh, today we're able to stay healthy longer uh, by getting various artificial parts <laughs> that uh, they, they didn't have. Uh, I'm happy to say my cataract surgery went very well. If you ever need the name of a very, very good cataract surgeon, I'll be happy to give it to you. In any case, back to, back to the 19th century. A modest jab at human bondage. Almost prophetically, Adams' first speech in his new position introduced a Pennsylvania petition to abolish slavery and the slave trade in the District of Columbia. Congress administered Washington directly and it was the home of thousands of slaves. Adams announced that he personally did not support abolition, but clearly he cherished the constitutional right of petition. Slavery's defenders violated the rights of free citizens, thereby making the peculiar institution everybody's problem, according to Jackson. This is not the moral high ground, but it was certainly um, closer to mainstream politics. Quincy Adams continued to resist and, well not resist, but resent uh, his defeat in the 1828 presidential election. And when some of the Jacksonian congressmen tried to arrange uh, a, a friendly meeting between the two, a meeting that uh, they hoped would end uh, in a friendly manner, uh, Adams was a, a poor loser, bad sport, and he resisted any reconciliation uh, with Jackson. Not surprisingly, the new president and his allies came to suspect that Adams' sole reason for returning to public office was to obstruct the administration's program. Liberty's rising tide. John Quincy Adams had entered the House of Representatives during Amer America's first great reform era. Since Haiti's black revolutionaries had abolished slavery in 1804, five South American nations, newly liberated from Spain, <coughs> had followed suit. Of greater significance for the United States 
England's parliament banned slavery in its Caribbean colonies in 1833. In London, watching the English proceedings was a young American, William Lloyd Garrison. Garrison returned to the United States having learned British methods of combating slavery and having made English friends. Soon they were inundating the U.S. with pamphlets invoking a higher authority than the Constitution. Simultaneously and independently, um, Protestant religious enthusiasts were pouring out of New York State's burned over district and into the Midwest. The burned over district was essentially the whole western half of um, New York State. A series of revivals led by Charles Grandison Finney preached that the heaven bound Christians had a duty to improve this world. In Boston, Garrison founded a powerful anti-slavery newspaper, The Liberator, on January 1st of 1831. Its masthead featured a slave breaking his shackles. Clearly, Garrison was aiming not only at the whites who could read, but also the African American slaves who, uh, who, who were not allowed uh, to learn to read. Every slave state had laws against teaching a, a black person uh, how to read. The Liberator started slowly, but Nat Turner's slave revolt in Virginia made Garrison's very name feared in Dixie. When abolitionist tracts swamped the slave states, many Southern post office officials illegally destroyed as many as they could find. Meanwhile, in the North, anti-abolitionist <coughs> mobbed speakers, wrecked anti-slavery presses, and disrupted meetings. Evangelist Finney converted Theodore Dwight Weld, who won over New York City's Tappan brothers, Lewis and Arthur. Lewis Tappan's great wealth financed much of the abolitionist movement. Soon to be famous figures, such as Edwin Stanton, Joshua Giddings, James G. Burney, Henry Ward Beecher, and his wife Harriet also joined the cause. Future women's rights crusaders Susan B. Anthony, Lucretia Mott, Lydia Maria Child, sorry about that. It, they just, they just can't leave us old folks alone. There we go. It'll be another 15 minutes before that thing, that thing rings again. Um, the future women's rights crusaders, Susan B. Anthony, Lucretia Mott, Lydia Maria Child, and Elizabeth Caddy, learn public ad agitation as abolitionists. Until December of 1835, Adams introduced anti-slavery petitions without overtly criticizing slavery itself. But the South's suppression of abolitionist mass mailings had spurred Garrison's American Anti-Slavery Society and its allies to redirect their efforts into flooding Congress with petitions. Southern congressmen railed against the petitions and the abolitionists. Adams, who surprisingly became less conservative with age, grew increasingly irritated with this new wave of Southern abuse. 
He also began re routinely denouncing the idea of annexing Texas, certain it would add several slave states to the Union. 26 years before Abraham Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation, Adams stressed that if sectional violence broke out, the federal government could use Congress's war powers to interfere with such slavery, as Adams put it, in every way possible. Slavery ascendant. On May 25th of 1836, the House of Representatives enacted the gag rule tabling all petitions regarding slavery or abolition without any reading. The measure passed by such a wide margin that Adams believed he would not live to see it repealed. The House renewed the gag rule during each Congress until January of 1840, when the regulation was promoted to a standing rule of the House that prohibited even the reception of anti-slavery petitions. Adams resolved to attack, flout, and circumvent the gag rule whenever possible. He became adept at introducing petitions that did not appear to fall within the gag rule's restrictions, only to conclude by calling for justice or humanity. Over the years, he presented literally hundreds of petitions. Adams also denounced President Jackson's theft of lands belonging to the Creeks and the Choctaws. Adams publicly insisted that women had political rights, even though they could not vote. Humble Washington workmen, laid off by congressional budget cuts, found a quiet ally in Adams, who cunningly slipped work and pay provisions into unrelated legislation. Abolitionists, abolitionists uh, persuaded him to put aside his other duties and rescue mutineers from the Spanish slave ship Amistad. In 1839, those in chains had killed the captain and cook and demanded to be returned to West Africa. At night, the ship's professional sailors aimed west toward America's slave states. <coughs> In a nice and fitting <coughs> piece of irony, however, they hit the free states instead. As the Africans sat in Connecticut jails, abolitionists took their case to the judicial system. John Quincy Adams was 74 years old when the matter reached the Supreme Court in 1841. He had not tried a case for more than 30 years. Nevertheless, over two days, he slashed through the evidence with outrage, sarcasm, and legal precision. He and the abolitionists won a seven to one decision which freed all the Amistad victims. Lewis Tappan's dry good, goods business still suffered from lingering effects of Panic of 1837. Nervously, he awaited a bill from Adams, but the former president never sent one. Adams found himself more popular than he had ever been before. To his surprise and delight, young women sought his autograph, and friends of recently deceased heroes invited him to present eulogies, quasi-abolitionists. Although Adams had become the abolitionist's congressional point man, he was not wholly one of them. 
He refused to abolish, to campaign to abolish slavery in the District of Columbia. While nearly every famous abolitionist tried to convince Adams to openly join their ranks, he refused to do so. Privately, Adams believed the abolitionists would willingly destroy the Union to achieve their goal. Indeed, until the Civil War's first shots were fired, anti-slavery leaders William Lloyd Garrison and Wendell Phillips routinely advocated disunion, let them go in peace, because slavery disgraced America. Victory and after. While John Quincy Adams differed with the radicals, nearly every movement member respected him. By the early 1840s, he stood at the pinnacle of his reputation, popularity, and oratorical power. The strength and gag rule seemed invincible. Public opinion, however, was gradually turning against it. William Lloyd Garrison had been using theatrical methods including publicly burning copies of the United States Constitution as a compromise with the devil. He did this for uh, at least a decade. Uh, political abolitionists had begun winning elections to local, state, and house positions. The North's population growth outpaced the South's and more abolitionist congressmen appeared every two years. In December 1841, Adams, using his sarcastic eloquence, attempted to repeal the permanent gag rule. He failed by just three votes. At an age when even his healthy contemporaries had begun winding up their earthly affairs, Adams had become the subject of magazine articles and even more public speaking invitations. Adams's devotion to petition rights led him to introduce pleas favoring ideas that he personally, personally abhorred. In 1842, he presented a petition from Haverhill, Massachusetts, <coughs> calling for the United States dissolution because sustaining the South drained Northern resources. That night, Southern Whigs began drafting a censure measure. Adams' attacks on slavery threatened to split the party along sectional lines. The formal motion accused Adams of high treason, all the worse because he was once the nation's quote unquote high priest. In his defense, Adams pointed out that the Constitution defines treason quite narrowly. He planned to argue that the slave South sought to destroy habeas corpus, trial by jury, and other basic liberties. The censure trial mesmerized the, de the District of Columbia for nine days. Adams risked expulsion from the House for presenting a petition offensive to the peculiar institution that the slave South so desperately wished not to discuss. Adams repeatedly demanded a criminal court trial government documents, and a postponement to prepare his defense. After he threatened to argue his case in the House continually for 90 days, slaveholders began seeking ways to end the embarrassment. Finally, John Botts of Virginia moved to table the Haverhill petition, and his colleagues agreed. Abolitionist Theodore Dwight Weld predicted many more victories. 
Yet just six weeks later, the Whig leadership censured abolitionist John Giddings of Ohio. Giddings responded by resigning, returning to his district, and being re-elected in triumph. The sectional realignment that foreshadowed the Civil War had commenced. Finally, Adams understood that only the battlefield would preserve human liberties. In 1843, he publicly labeled himself as an abolitionist. The House finally repealed the gag rule on December 3rd of 1844 after eight inglorious years. Fittingly, John Quincy Adams introduced the motion restoring free speech. On February 23rd of 1848, John Quincy Adams died after collapsing in the House of Representatives two days earlier. Uh, historian Joseph Whelan summarizes Adams' post-presidential career in a fitting manner, quote, rather than being a museum piece from America's founding generation, Adams became Congress's conscience, end quote. His passing commenced the greatest outpouring of grief for an American public figure since George Washington's death in 1799. Its equal would not be seen until Abraham Lincoln's assassination in 1865. Well, thank you, and uh, thank you very much. Open the floor for questions. Oh, of course. Of course. Uh, are there any questions? Yes, sir. Um, Given uh, John Quincy Adams' reluctance to, uh, to be too overt with his, his uh, while he was in, in, in the uh, house, <coughs> I, I thought that the uh, Massachusetts was much more abolitionist than it was at that time. He, he, it was not that he didn't have a tremendous backing? Well, first of all, it was very common in the 1830s for abolitionists to be mobbed when they tried to give a speech in the North. Yeah, that was my question. When Wendell Phillips came to the movement, Wendell Phillips was one of several figures who uh, is sometimes, uh, it is argued that uh, he was the greatest orator of the 19th century. Well, different people can have different opinions on that, but what attracted Wendell Phillips to the movement was uh, when he and his girlfriend watched an anti-abolitionist mob pulling Garrison through the streets uh, at the end of a rope. Fortunately, the rope was around his chest and not his neck. But uh, Phillips uh, brought an eloquence to the abolitionist movement that even Garrison's spectacular theatrics <laughs> could not match. Um, sometimes when people advocate ideas that are too progressive for the times, uh, they, they meet a surprising amount of resistance. Uh, does anyone think Bernie Sanders could have been elected to the Senate in 1950? I, I, I really don't think so. So the North is the, ab the abolitionist presence in the North started out small, met ferocious existence, and finally over time came to be accepted first as a nuisance. And while all of this evolution was going <coughs> on, a younger generation was growing up hearing <coughs> abolitionist stories uh, from their nursery room. And, and this is where the abolitionist triumph is an inspiration to those of us on the left. Uh, 
society can change and has changed, but it, it usually doesn't happen rapidly in this country. France is another story. They've had 12 different constitutions in 250 years. So did, did I answer you? No, you, you, yes, you did. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? I, I'm sure many of you already knew much of this. I mean, I, I didn't get into any primary services. Sean. Yes. Um, as far as, you know, that had very intensive and violent opposition to the abolitionists in New England, uh, I don't know if you found, I, I find some historians have said that it has something to do with the cotton textile industry in New England, that they were, they were concerned that, you know, if slavery is abolished, uh, that that's just going to ruin the, the textile industry of, of New England. Well, similar excuses were made um, by financiers in New York City. They, they, they wanted to continue commerce with the South. Um, so New York City, even before the draft drives, was uh, hostile to the uh, uh, abolitionists. And, uh, decades ago, I remember reading an article in uh, the Policy Studies Journal that slavery really was a major problem generated for Boston. Oh, of course. Say again, please. Is that uh, slavery was a financial profit for Boston after there was that much slavery in Massachusetts, but the, uh, you might speak to that. Well, I, I can tell you that uh, more than 50 years, more than 60 years ago, Eric Williams wrote a book called Capitalism and Slavery, and it made the argument that much of the investment capital that came into the United States from Great Britain was capital that was made through the slave trade. For instance, the mayor of Liverpool, England, was always a slave trader. Uh, and, and so the hostility uh, obviously had a geographic dimension, but I, I think most people who have looked at the abolitionists would argue that um, the, the extent of abolitionism in the North uh, has been greatly overestimated uh, in the early years. What was, by, by, the, by the 1850s, what was much more popular was free soil. Free soil was the idea of a frontier state to not allow any Africans, free or slave, into their, uh, their state. It's not the moral high ground, but uh, it could appeal to even white races. And so it, it politically had a much larger audience uh, by the 1850s. But there were a lot of abolitionists who took severe physical beatings for preaching what one would think would would be common sense. Yes, sir. Well, even into the 20th century, um, it was stylish to demean the abolitionists as fanatics who created an unnecessary war. And it was not until the late 40s when Bernard de Moto and Arthur Schlesinger Jr., who you mentioned, blew the whistle on that, saying it made no more sense to argue that there should not have been abolitionists in the South than to say that there should not have been anti-Nazis under Hitler. Yeah. Is correct. Very, very good example. Um, also, many of the really good writings on the politics of the 1850s uh, were presented from the point of view, uh, from a point of view, that was either openly hostile to the abolitionists or emphasized their marginalized age, um, especially in the uh, Yes, sir, the gentleman in the back. Yes, so did you run across in your, in your uh, research on Adams his, anything about his relationship with Daniel Webster? Um, there are many good books on John Quincy Adams. Uh, a number of them are 700 pages, so um, it was a busy summer. Um, but uh, yes, uh, Adams 
did not like Daniel Webster. Uh, he saw Daniel Webster's ambition as morally vacuous. Uh, and I, I think Adams still carried a certain amount of resentment toward uh, any, any unity with the Jacksonians. Uh, it, it's interesting. Adams was so religious that he would go to two Sunday church services when, whenever possible. And it didn't much matter to him as long as they were Protestant uh, congregations, he would go. Uh, but part of fundamentalist Christianity emphasizes forgiveness. I, I don't see a lot of forgiveness in John Quincy Adams. I, I don't believe it was his motive to simply interfere with the Jackson administration, but certainly his motive was to interfere with slavery, and, and he was quite proud of that. And, and Jackson, of course, was a wealthy slave owner by the time he started going, running for president. Other questions? Uh, I'm, I'm sorry that we, we don't have people to pick things apart and debate with, but um, I guess. Oh, well, given that in the 19th century, Mike just mentioned, since you know we're uh, dealing with human rights, uh, uh, anybody in the room know the things about Alphonse Jackson, who is a prominent African American legislator in this area? And uh, he. Uh, Anyway, but he was another uh, legislator involved with uh, establishing uh, human rights. Uh, he chaired a uh, committee at the Louisiana Constitution Convention of uh, 1973, and uh, it turns out we've got uh, the strongest uh, anti-discrimination measures in our state constitution in uh, Louisiana, which is currently in effect, and we're even ahead of the Frankfurt and our 11th Constitution. But, anyway, this is for human rights with the legislative um, process, but here we go, another question. It yes, probably uh, would be inappropriate to have this discussion end without mentioning that Adams became known as, not as president, but in the House as old man eloquent. Well, that was one, one of the parts of the longer paper that I trimmed down for a 20 minute presentation. Oh. Um, but uh, you, you can uh, hopefully read about it. Uh, we're, we're going to tried very hard to get a book out of this, and uh, uh, I, I think Dr. Peterson has had a very good record on um, turning these conferences into something that would reach a, a much broader audience. Okay, well, uh, I don't suppose anybody's going to make a militant uh, defense of slavery. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. The next session will be on the uh, transition shared by Helen Wise, Bill Hughes Report. So we can, here we have Dr. Peterson. We can take a 20 minute break and have muffins and coffee and. Uh,